السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ نحمد ونصلی علی رسول کریم اما بعد فعود بلّہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ربش رحلی صدری ویسلی امری وحل العدتم لسانی یفقه قولی بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الرحمن علم القرآن خلق الإنسان علمه البيان الشمس والقمر بحسبان والنجم والشجر يسجدان والسماء رفعها ووضع الميزان ألا تطغوا في الميزان وأقيم الوزن بالقسط ولا تخسر الميزان والأرض وضعها للأنام فيها فاكهة والنخل ذات الأكمام والحب ذو العصف والريحان فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان What you heard just now Which surah was this? Surah Al-Rahman Surah Al-Rahman is one of the chapters of the Quran One of the chapters of the book of our Lord With which none of us is unfamiliar Every single one of us has heard the surah Perhaps some of us have even memorized it And many of us love this surah. We adore this surah. Why? Because this surah, if you look at the name of the surah, it is Ar-Rahman. It talks about the blessings of our Lord, the Most Merciful, upon us. It talks about the expressions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy on us in our lives, without which we could never survive. We could never attain anything in our lives. The name of Allah, Ar-Rahman, actually means the Rahmatul Wasi'ah. The one who possesses great mercy, vast mercy. Such mercy that is all-encompassing, that surrounds everything, that has taken everything in its fold. Meaning there is nothing at all that is unaffected by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the mercy of Ar-Rahman. This is the reason why we see that the surah, it begins with Ar-Rahman. When we think about the mercy of Allah, many times what comes to our mind is the things that surround us, the things that we enjoy, the beauty that Allah has created for us the pleasures that we experience in our lives. But it's amazing. When you begin the surah and you read Ar-Rahman, the first expression of Allah's mercy that He mentions is Allam al-Qur'an. He who taught the Qur'an. He who has given the knowledge of the best book. Of his speech, of his message. To who? To us. To people. And then Allah says, خَلَقَ insan, He who created the human being. This is something that we admit. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings on us are numerous. There are many. Allah says in the Qur'an that إِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْصُوهَا If you start counting and listing the blessings of Allah on you, you would never ever be able to list them. You would never be able to enumerate them. You could never give a number. Why? Because they are unlimited. Which is why many of us, when we try to think about the blessings of Allah in our lives, we don't know where to start from. Why? Because there are too many. 
And we don't know what to count and what to leave out. Alright? Because there are so many blessings. But there are many blessings that we see, we notice, we benefit from them, we appreciate them, we are grateful for them, and this is why we also remember them. For example, the blessing of our parents. Right? The blessing of children. The blessing of health. The blessing of wealth. We say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very, very merciful upon me. He has given me this blessing, this blessing. And alhamdulillah, that's really good that we remember these blessings and we thank Allah for them. But at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us other blessings which we sometimes don't even realize. We don't even think about them. We don't even notice them. Until sometimes it's too late. When we lose it, then we realize that it was a blessing. I'm going to mention to you a very important, a very major blessing, but we don't think about it much. And that is the blessing of life. The rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on us, that He created us, that He made us. Imagine if He never created us. Would we enjoy the things that we enjoy? Would we gain pleasure by the things that we do gain pleasure by? No. You know, it's sometimes that we feel something, we are happy because of something, and there are others who have never experienced it. So we feel bad for them. We pity them. That you can never know the joy that I feel in my heart. You can never experience what I am going through right now. And I wish you could, but I know you can't. So we feel bad for people who cannot experience the good that we are experiencing. The blessing of life is such a huge blessing. And think about it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He created us as who? As human beings. As the children of Adam alayhi salam. As people who have bodies that are not useless, that are not empty. Rather, Allah has blessed us with hearts, with minds, with amazing faculties. There are many other animals also that can hear, that can see, that can even learn many things. But a human being, the way he sees, the way he hears, the way he thinks, the way he learns is very, very different. What is it that differentiates a human being from the rest of the creatures? It's the kind of heart that Allah has blessed the human being with. This heart, this qalb, it doesn't just sustain our physical existence, that it's pumping blood all the time. And because of that we are alive, because of that we are functioning, because of that we can move about. No, it's not just that. This heart is also the center of our spiritual growth, our spiritual sustenance. Which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He gave the blessing of Qur'an, He revealed it where? On the heart. We learn in the Qur'an that Allah says about Angel Jibreel that نَزَلَ بِهِ الرُّوحُ الْأَمِينَ That the Qur'an has been brought down by the trustworthy being, meaning the trustworthy angel. عَلَىٰ قَلْبِكَ Upon your heart, O Prophet ﷺ. Why? لِتَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُنْزِرِينَ So that you would be of those who warn. So the Qur'an was sent down on the heart. Why? Because this heart, you can say, is the most important piece of flesh that is in your body. So important that the Prophet ﷺ said about it, that if it is good, then the entire body is good. And if this heart, this one piece of flesh, if it gets corrupted, then the entire body is corrupted. It is ruined. It is destroyed. So what does that show to us? That the heart needs the Qur'an so that it can function well, so that the entire body can be good. Because if this heart is not working properly, then what will happen? The entire body will follow suit, right? It will also get corrupted. If you have love in your heart for somebody, that love, it shows how? By the way you talk to them, by the way you look at them, the way you smile at them, the kind of things that you will do for them. Your body will follow your heart. And if there is hatred in the heart, what will happen? The entire body will comply. 
Whatever is in your heart, your body is a slave to that. Which is why some scholars, Ibn Qayyim, he writes about the heart, that the qalb is the malik, the heart is the king. And the entire body is a servant to the heart. The entire body is the servant to the heart. Whatever your heart wants, the body will do. Whatever your heart does not want, the body will reject. There could be some food that you don't like, even if it tastes amazing, even if it's very, very nutritious. But just because you don't want it, when you will put it in your mouth, you cannot swallow it. You may have seen this happen to some people, or you may have experienced it yourself, that the body rejects what the heart does not want. And if there's something that the heart desires, then the body will go through every pain and every effort to satisfy that desire. This is how important the heart is. This is the role that our heart plays in our lives. So isn't it important that the heart should be taken care of? Isn't it necessary? Because if the heart is not good, it can lead the entire body into its own destruction. Doesn't it happen that people know that certain foods can be very, very bad for their health, but just because they like them, they will eat them, even though they will suffer from the consequences. And eventually a point comes where the body cannot handle it anymore. The body cannot handle it anymore. So it just stops functioning. It fails. It cannot survive anymore. So if we want to be successful in this dunya, in the akhirah, if we want our relationships to be better, if we want our salah to be better, if we want our thinking to be good, if we want our speech to improve, then what is necessary? Where should we concentrate? The heart. The heart. Because if that is good, the entire body is good. And if that is bad, the entire body will be bad. The entire life of a person will be ruined. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, that, O mankind, there has come to you from your Lord an advice, an instruction. And also, shifa'un lima fi sudu, a cure for that which is in the heart. The Quran is not just food, it is also a cure, it is also a remedy. Why? Why do we need this remedy? Why do we need this cure? Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not create the hearts healthy? Yes. The heart that Allah blessed us with was created very, very healthy. It was created on the fitrah. It is naturally submissive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then what happens over time? What happens? That it gets corrupted because of the sins that we commit. In the hadith we learned that when a person commits a sin then a black dot appears on the heart. It begins to decay. It becomes stained. It gets dirty. Then what is necessary? That the stain is left. The dirt is left. What is necessary? That it's washed off. It's cleaned. But it's too hard. Why bother? Why bother? Because if you don't clean it, it's your own loss. It's going to get sick. And if it is not cured, it's going to eventually die. The thing is that we live in this dunya, right? We live in this world. And every single thing in this world has good in it and it also has bad in it, right? There's nothing in this dunya which is all good. Every object, everything, every khalq has good and evil. Which is why we see that when the Prophet ﷺ, when he was building The first masjid, Masjid al-Nabawi, with his companions in Medina. He was reciting verses of poetry. He was saying, Allahumma la khayra illa khayra al-akhira. Oh Allah, there is no good except the good of the hereafter. Meaning there is nothing that is really 100% good in this dunya. Because no matter what you have in this world, you will enjoy it, but you will also experience some bitterness because of it. Is that true? Do we experience that in our lives? Many times. Many times, the same children whom you adore, you love them, you will kiss their toes, you will kiss their cheeks, you will hold them and you will hug them, right? And you can never have enough of loving them. There will be times when you will want to not even look at your children because you are so upset, right? 
There will be times when you will be so hurt because of those same children that you want to yell at them. Right? The same children whom mothers, you know, touch with soft hands, pat them with their soft hands. The same mothers will slap their children with those very hands. Why? Is it because the children are all evil? No. It's just that they have some good and they also have some evil. Right? You could own something. Could be your phone. Could be your clothes. They're good. Very beautiful. But at the same time, they also have some evil in them. And what is that? The fact that they go bad. The fact that they need maintenance. The fact that they require work from you. So everything of this dunya, what does it demand? Maintenance. It demands maintenance. If you don't maintain it, if you don't look after it, if you don't take care of it, then what will happen? It will get dirty. It will decay. It will go bad. And eventually it will die. If there is a plant, what does it require? That you just put it in a nice beautiful flower pot and put it in one of the corners of your house and just leave it there? If you do that, then what's going to happen to it? For a few days, it will remain nice and fresh and green. But after a few days, you will see that the leaves are drooping. The color is fading. The green is turning into beige. Flowers or leaves, whatever they are, are becoming dry. So what does that demand from you? That you water it. That you make sure it gets sunlight. So everything in this dunya demands maintenance. You buy any machine, even if it's a hair dryer, right? It will come with maintenance instructions. Even if you buy dishes and you wonder, what maintenance instructions do they need? Everything needs instructions for its maintenance and well-being. Because if it is neglected, it will get destroyed. So does the heart. The heart cannot be ignored. It cannot be neglected. If we neglect the heart, then what will happen? The heart that was born on fitrah, that was born with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that was naturally submissive to Allah, what will happen to that heart? It will have love for other than Allah. It will develop that love so much so that the love for Allah is much less. It will not desire to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That humbleness, that submissiveness will gradually become weak and it will gradually leave. This is the reason why sometimes we feel that our iman is very strong, very high. And then at other moments we feel that that iman is going down. There are some times when we feel so grateful for the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with. And we are crying and we're mentioning them. We're thanking Allah for them, remembering them. And then the same person, that is you and I, what happens to us? We forget all the blessings and we start feeling so pity for ourselves. And this is why we cry and we complain and we think about what we don't have, things that we deserve, yet they're missing from our lives, the harm that other people have caused us. We remember the bad things. Despite the fact that we were grateful once upon a time. Where did that gratitude go? It went. Why? Because you didn't keep that gratitude alive. Likewise, we could be very positive in our thinking. But if you don't maintain those feelings, then what will happen? A time will come when we become extremely negative. We're always focusing on the negatives instead of the positives. We could be very fearful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at certain moments. And at other moments, it could be as though we have no fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So why is this so? That at one point the heart is in a very, very good condition. And at other points it's not. Because its well-being was not maintained. The heart was neglected. And when it was neglected, it got corrupted. And when it's corrupted, then you need to do some scrubbing. Right? You need to wash it. You need to clean it. How do you clean the things of this dunya? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Wash it with water. Right? Yes, there are other things as well that you need. But one of the basic things that we need to do is wash with water. Now your heart, you cannot pull it out and wash it with water. There's a different kind of water that it needs. 
There's a different kind of food. There's a different kind of medication. A different kind of sustenance that it needs. And what is that? The book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Quran. This is the reason why we learn in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Fussilat, Ayah 39, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنَّكَ تَرَى الْأَرْضَ خَاشِعَةً It is of His signs that you see the earth that is stilled. Meaning it is lifeless, it is barren, it is nothing growing on it. فَإِذَا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْهَا الْمَاءِ But then when we send down upon it water, meaning rain from the sky, اِهْتَزَّتْ The same soil that was dead, flat, it begins to move and quiver. As each drop falls on it, it begins to quiver. اِهْتَزَّتْ وَرَبَتْ And it swells with the moisture that it's absorbing. And then what happens with the moisture, with the water that it has absorbed? It grows vegetation. It grows different, different plants. That is a source of life for that very land and also a source of life for so many other creatures. From insects to birds to animals to even human beings. Everything benefits from the vegetation that grows from the ground. But where does it come from? How does it grow? Because of the rain that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down on it. Allah says, إِنَّ الَّذِي أَحْيَاهَا Indeed, the one who gave life to it, who gave life to this land, this dead land, لَمُحْيَ الْمَوْتَى Surely He is the one who will give life to the dead people. When? On the Day of Judgment. إِنَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ Indeed, He is over all things competent. Now this verse, yes, It is proving that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the power to resurrect people on the day of judgment. However, the ulama have said that this ayah is also talking about the reviving of the hearts. That how a person sometimes feels dead inside, lifeless inside. He feels empty. There's no motivation, nothing to drive him. He cannot enjoy anything, doesn't find anything interesting. He could be eating the best food, but nah, wasn't that great. He had a whole week off. The break is already over. Right? He could be wearing the most comfortable clothes, but yet he is not satisfied. Why? Because it's not the body that is not satisfied. It's the heart that is not satisfied. It's the heart that needs some food. It needs some motivation. It was dead. And then, when the Qur'an... When the Qur'an becomes a part of a person's life, when a person receives the knowledge of the book of Allah, that same boredom, it turns into productivity. That same meaningless life turns into such a productive and beneficial life. Look at the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. How amazing are their stories? What kind of lives were they living? Dead lives. They were just busy killing one another. That's literally what they were doing. And just concerned about their properties and their fame and their good name, that's all that they were concerned about. But when the Qur'an became a part of their lives, look at how entire history changed basically. The fate of the Arabian Peninsula changed basically. The Arabs were the people about whom no one cared. The Persians and the Romans, they fought with one another for years and years, centuries, literally. Decades. Why? Because they wanted the power. And Arabia, even though it was right next to them, they bordered with Arabia, but they never bothered to wage any war over there. Why? There was nothing in Arabia. Nothing at all. But as soon as Islam came, and they saw the success that the Muslims were heading towards, that is when the encounters happened between the Muslims and the Romans, and as well as the Persians. Umar anhu, he used to say that we are a people who have been honored because of what? Because of this deen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought us this honor, how? Through this religion that He has given to us. Because without it, before it, what were we? We were in jahiliyyah, we were ignorant basically. We were living useless lives, purposeless lives, aimless lives. And when this Qur'an came in our lives, that is when we changed. That is when we became successful. And we learned amazing stories of the companions. The what kind of people they became because of Qur'an becoming a part of their lives. They became even more courageous. 
even more responsible, even more honest, even more determined. Why? Because of the Qur'an. So, the same way when the Qur'an, the shower of the Qur'an, the rain of Qur'an falls on the heart of a person, اِهْتَزَّتْ وَرَبَتْ It is as though a person has been given a new life to live. He has been given a new chance. He sees things that he never saw before. What's the difference between a person who is alive and a person who is dead? The living one sees, the dead one doesn't see. The living one hears, and the dead one doesn't hear. The living one enjoys, the dead one doesn't. So likewise, when a person learns the Qur'an, when the Qur'an becomes a part of his life, it's as though he is seeing things for the first time, his perspective changes. He begins to observe things that he never observed before. He realizes things that he never realized before. And only he can understand the one who actually learns the Qur'an. Because until and unless a person learns the Qur'an, he doesn't know what I'm talking about basically. She can never have any idea. You have to go through this to experience this, to understand this. إِنَّ الَّذِي أَحْيَاهَا لَمُحْيِي الْمَوْتَى إِنَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ Indeed, he is capable over everything. And we see that the Prophet ﷺ, he said that مَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينِ Whomsoever Allah wishes good for, then Allah gives him the understanding of the religion. He gives him the knowledge of the deen, the understanding of the deen, who? The person for whom Allah wants good. Notice the hadith doesn't say that Allah will give him wealth. Allah will give him great opportunities. Allah will bless him with beautiful children. Allah will bless him with the best spouse. No, that's not what is mentioned. What is mentioned that Allah will give him the understanding of the deen. Because when a person has the Qur'an in his or her life, then many, many doors to goodness open for him. You know why? Because he has learned. He has gained knowledge. And when you gain knowledge, you become aware of things that you weren't aware of before. You see opportunities that you did not see before, even though they existed in the past. If a person has knowledge of, let's say, stock market, right? Then he knows, okay, this is a good chance to invest your money. By the way, I'm not saying that it's okay to do it or it's not okay to do it. This is just an example, okay? So he knows that, okay, this is a good chance to invest your money, this much money, right? In this cause, and this is the time when you sell the stocks, this is the time when you buy the stocks, and this is how I will gain profit. Well, didn't similar chances exist before? Yes. Why didn't he avail them? Because he didn't know them. When he got to know, then the opportunities are right before him. Right? And then he can seize those opportunities and benefit from them and literally become a millionaire like people do. What's the difference over here? Knowledge. Ilm. So, مَن يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينِ Whoever Allah wishes good for, He gives him the understanding of the deen. A poet once said, الْعِلْمُ يُحْيِي قُلُوبَ الْمَيِّتِينَ كَمَا يُحْيِي الْبِلَادَ إِذَا مَاتَتِ الْمَطَرُ A poet said that knowledge, it revives the heart of the dead. Just as the land that has died is brought to life by rain. These days we see that the land is dying. Okay, Why? Because as fall is coming, we see that the leaves are falling off. The grass will eventually become faded. right? It will lose its vibrant color. But then after a few months from now, inshallah, we will see the other way around. That the same grass which is beige, which is just colorless basically, it will become so green and vibrant that it's attractive almost. You can't drive by without looking at it, without noticing it. The same trees which are just brown, barren, nothing on them. The same trees will have beautiful flowers blooming on them such that you will sometimes stop in order to look at those flowers. Right? So the dead land, it comes to life. Why? 
because of rain. And just like that, knowledge revives the heart of the dead people. And sometimes we experience this death in our hearts. That sometimes we feel that, yeah, I know I have to pray, but I, I don't have the motivation. I feel like I can't concentrate. I don't want to. I don't feel like it. I know I should be reciting the Qur'an, but I just don't know when and how and how much. I just don't have the drive. I know I should be fasting. My mother fasts a lot. I fasted the entire month of Ramadan, but somehow that motivation is not there anymore. So what is necessary then? What is necessary? That the knowledge must be improved, must be increased. This is why the Prophet ﷺ, he was taught to make dua, وَقُلْ رَبِّ زِدْنِي عِلْمًا And say, O oh my Lord, increase me in knowledge. Imagine the Prophet ﷺ was told to ask for increase in knowledge. Why? Because no matter how much you have learned, you have never learned enough. Never. Every time you learn, you are reviving your heart. Every time you learn something beneficial, you're boosting your heart with life, with more energy. And that energy you need in order to use your body in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the body is only controlled by the heart. Just like a country is controlled by the king. So the king has to be good for the country to be good. And if the king is not good, the country cannot be good. The people cannot be good. The poet continues, وَالْعِلْمُ يَجْلُ الْعَمَى عَنْ قَلْبِ صَاحِبِهِ كَمَا يُجَلِّ سَوَادَ الظُّلْمَةِ الْقَمَرُ And knowledge dispels blindness from the heart of its owner. Hmm? That sometimes the heart is blind. That a person sees, but he doesn't see. He doesn't understand. He doesn't get it. But when he learns, then that blindness goes away. Let me give you an example that you can relate with. Your kitchen. You know about every part of your kitchen. So what happens? When you go in the kitchen, you see everything. You see where every dish is kept, where every food is kept in the refrigerator, what is in every drawer. You see what's on the counter, you see what's on the floor, you see what's in the sink. You see everything. Why? Because you know your kitchen. Then what happens when you send your child to go grab you Something from a drawer in the kitchen. What do they come and tell you? I can't find it. I don't see it. And what do we think? They're just making excuses. Right? But sometimes, it's not excuses. Really, they cannot see. Why? Because they don't know. They don't know. And you tell them, look here. Look in this particular place. And then you will find it. And the more you send them to the kitchen to bring things for you, the more you make them work in the kitchen, the more familiar they become with their surroundings, and the more familiar they are, the more they observe things. Why is it that you notice every piece of garbage on the floor, and there are other people who don't even see it? Why? What's the difference? Because you know, and they don't know. You know and they don't know. So when a person gains knowledge, then blindness of the heart, it goes away. Just as the full moon dispels the blackness of a dark night. In a dark night, who can see anything? You can't see anything at all. But if the full moon is there, then you can notice many things. You can notice many things. There are people who read books in moonlight. There are people who wrote books in moonlight. Why? Because it was bright enough for them to see. Huh? It was bright enough for them to see. So just like that, when a person gains knowledge, then he can see things. He can see things. No matter how dark the surroundings may be. No matter how far people may be from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he can notice things. He can observe things. What's the difference? Knowledge. This is the reason why it is necessary that we don't just recite the Qur'an, but we also learn the meaning of the Book of Allah. We talk about the rights of people, the rights of children, the rights of women, right? Rights of so many people, so many causes and even animals, right? We're very big on demanding rights, on making people aware of the rights of others. 
the Qur'an also has certain rights on us. What are those rights? First of all, the Qur'an has a right that we believe in it. That we believe it is the book of Allah, that Allah sent it. It is a right of the Qur'an to be believed in. Likewise, it is a right of the Qur'an that it should be recited, that it should be read, that a person does tilawa of it. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't just reveal the Qur'an for us to keep, for us to own a copy of, for us to kiss, for us to listen to. He also sent it so that we recite it. It was the way of the Prophet ﷺ that he would recite the Qur'an. Allah says, يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ He recites to the people his verses. The Prophet ﷺ regularly recited the Qur'an. So it is the right of the Qur'an that it be recited. Which is why, alhamdulillah, one of the things that's very common amongst Muslims is that as soon as a child is able to read and write, he is also taught how to recite the Qur'an. A lot of emphasis is laid on this. But the Qur'an has more rights. Amongst them is also that a person learns the meaning of it. That what does it say? What does it teach? What is it telling us? Because if the recitation is so powerful, the words are so powerful, it's so heart touching, it's so moving, then imagine if you were to know the meaning of those words, how much they would move you to action. How much they can change a person. You know sometimes you just hear the recitation of the Qur'an and you start crying. You may not even know what is being said, but you just know that these are the words of my Allah and they're so beautiful that I cannot keep the tears back. Imagine if you understood the meaning of those words. What effect would they have on you? So aren't we missing on something? Aren't we missing out on something if we don't know the meaning of it? Think about it. If there is somebody, a friend of yours, who speaks a language different from yours, and another friend, they're talking in that language, laughing, sharing something, and you have no clue. Would you mind? Or no? We say we don't mind, but we do feel left out. Which is why we say, hey, English please. Right? We say, please switch. I don't understand what you're saying. Switch please. I need to be a part of this. Because we feel left out. That why did she smile? And why did she laugh? What was that joke? And what is she talking about so passionately? How can I miss out on this? So just like that, how can we miss out on the beautiful words of Allah? How can we not know the meaning? We have to know the meaning. How can we be satisfied by not knowing what those words mean? We can never be satisfied. We should never be satisfied. Likewise, of the rights of the Qur'an is that it should be reflected on. That we reflect on it. We reflect on many things. Our nails, right? Sometimes we just look at the mirror and reflect on our skin. We feel our hair with our hands and we reflect on the texture, right? On our hair, how healthy they are, how dry they are. We reflect on many things. We reflect on our children, what kind of things they're learning, what kind of behavior they're developing, right? We reflect on many things. Sometimes they are useful. That reflection is very beneficial. And many times it's not that beneficial. Isn't it so? But the Qur'an, it deserves that we reflect on it. Why? Because when we reflect on it, it will actually benefit us. Allah says in the Qur'an, that this is a book that we have revealed. Why? لِيَدَّبَّرُوا ayati, So that they reflect on its verses. And the verse continues, وَلِيَتَذَكَّرَ أُولُو الْأَلْبَابِ And so the people who have reason, the people who have intellect, they would take a lesson from it. So we need lessons in our lives, lessons that we can implement, we can benefit from. And we cannot learn them until we reflect on the Qur'an. So the beauty is that when a person studies the meaning of the book of Allah, automatically he reflects on it. He reflects on it. When he reflects on it, compares it with his life, finds solutions, then it is a big blessing on him. Likewise, it is of the rights of the Qur'an that it be acted upon, that a person does amal on it. He implements it in his or her life. Now what can you implement? What can you implement? What you know? 
What can you practice? What you know. Which is why, even if you are really good at driving, you cannot get your license until and unless you have given a written exam that shows that you know what? The rules of the road. Not just of the vehicle, but of the road. Because you cannot implement if you don't know. You cannot practice what you don't know. So before you take your vehicle on the road, you have to take a test that shows that you have knowledge of the various signs that are out there. Right? When you are allowed to turn, when you are not allowed to turn, how you are supposed to turn, what every sign means, you need to have that knowledge. Because if you don't have it, you can get into serious problems. Right? So if for this dunya, we need knowledge, then what about for the akhirah? What about the deen? Knowledge is necessary in this regard as well. Because we know that we have to practice right, good things in order to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what are those good things? Where can we learn them from? From the book of Allah. That book of Islamic studies that perhaps we studied in Sunday school, weekend school, or perhaps we studied in our school, full-time school, whatever school we went to, or the book that perhaps our parents taught us. Yes, we learned many good things from there. But there are many more things that Allah has revealed in His book, and we deserve to know them. We deserve to know them. Believe me, my dear sisters, if we don't know them, we are harming ourselves. We are literally depriving ourselves. It's as though there is a plant that needs water, and we have the water, yet we don't give it that water. Isn't this injustice with the plant? Yes. So likewise, if we don't learn the good things that Allah has taught us, we are being unjust and unfair with ourselves. So this is why it is a right of the Qur'an that it be implemented. And you can only implement once you know. Likewise, it is of the rights of the Qur'an that it be conveyed to others. It be passed on. It be taught. But what can you teach? What can you give? What can you pass on? What do you have yourself? Something that you've taken yourself. If you don't have money that you've earned through some work, how can you give in charity? You can only give a gift once you've bought it, once you own it. If you don't have anything, you can't give anything. So now think about it, of the rights that I've mentioned to you over here, how many rights of the Qur'an are we really giving in our day-to-day lives? Perhaps one, yes, alhamdulillah, we believe in the Qur'an. Perhaps the second one, that yes, we recite it regularly, every day, or at least every other day, or at least once a week, We put in the effort to recite the Qur'an. Okay, very good. But there are many more rights that we need to give to the Qur'an. You know why? Because on the Day of Judgment, the Prophet ﷺ will complain to Allah that, Oh my Lord, my people abandoned this Qur'an. Abandoned this Qur'an. They didn't give it its rights. So if we are not giving the rights of the Qur'an, Imagine the Prophet ﷺ complaining to Allah against us. Think about it. This Qur'an is what the Prophet ﷺ received through wahi. He recited it. He taught it. He passed it on. Was it easy? Was it easy for him to receive the wahi? Was it? No. If you've ever studied the sciences of the Qur'an, you must have come across the fact that the wahi, the revelation that the Prophet ﷺ received, it was very, very physically difficult upon him. The first revelation, what happened when he received it? He came home and he said, cover me, cover me, cover me. Because he was shivering. He was physically shaken up. Yes, because of the new experience, but also because it was physically exhausting. It took a toll on his health. We learned that if the Prophet ﷺ would be on a camel and the wahi would come, the camel would sit down. Imagine a huge camel could not bear the pressure. Just imagine. If the Prophet ﷺ had his knee on the knee of one of his friends who would be sitting next to him, that companion would think that his knee would break because of the pressure. If it was a cold night, 
And those of you who have gone to Medina in winter know what kind of a cold night Medina can have. A cold night. And the wahi would come and the Prophet ﷺ would begin to sweat. This is just the difficulty that he went through in order to receive the Qur'an. Then the difficulty he went through in order to convey the Qur'an, recite the Qur'an before people who didn't want to listen. Recite the Qur'an to people who said, you are a liar, you are a magician, you are a poet. Imagine how difficult it must have been for him to recite the Qur'an in front of them. But he did that. So much so that he was expelled from his homeland. So much so that people came to kill him. So much so that he spent many days hungry, many nights in fear. And this Qur'an, today we get in a beautiful print in one book. We purchase it for $10. We own it. We are so happy about it. And we just keep it on a bookshelf. Or we keep it by our bedside. The Qur'an that we got for $10. We spent only $10 on it. And the Prophet ﷺ, he underwent so much difficulty for it. He passed it on to us. And here we are, that we don't even want to open it. We don't even want to know what it says. We don't even want to know what gems Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent to us. You know the word surah, the word surah. Is from Sinwara, and from the same root is the word Siwar, and Siwar is used for a bracelet. So think about a bracelet, like for example, of pearls, connected with beautiful pearls, and just like that, every surah contains so many gems, so many beauties, for us to look at, for us to appreciate, for us to benefit from. And here we are, keeping those gems closed in boxes, kept away. What good are those gems? If we're not using them, if we're not adorning ourselves with them, what good are they? Isn't this unfair that someone put in so much effort to purchase them, to bring them to you, to take them out of the water, to clean them, to make them into a beautiful bracelet, bring them to you, gift them to you, and here you are, you've just kept it away. That's unfair. The Prophet ﷺ will complain on the Day of Judgment that, Oh my Lord, these people abandoned the Qur'an. So we don't want to be of those people about whom the Prophet ﷺ will complain. We want to be of those people of whom the Prophet ﷺ will be proud of. That these are the ones who gave the rights of the Qur'an, who understood the Qur'an, who lived the Qur'an, who passed it on to others. They're the ones who carried it forward. They're the ones who made this Qur'an come to every heart, every home, every life, every person, every hand. We want to be of those people of whom the Prophet ﷺ will be proud of on the Day of Judgment. In a hadith we learn, whoever reads the Qur'an and acts upon what is contained in it. Whoever reads the Qur'an and acts upon what is contained in it. His parents will be made to wear a crown on the Day of Judgment, the brightness of which will excel that of the sun if the same were within your worldly houses. Imagine the crown so bright that it's brighter than the sun. And the sun is so bright that when it rises in the sky, everything becomes visible. So much so that sometimes they're so bright that you can't even look at them. They're so bright. Imagine the brightness of that crown. So what do you think about the person who himself acts upon it? Because this is the honor being given to who? The parents of the person who reads the Qur'an and implements it. Imagine the person, the kind of reward that will be granted to him and her if he reads it and implements it in his life. In a hadith we learn, the Prophet ﷺ said, The example of a believer, because we all believe in the Qur'an, right? But we believe at different levels. Some people stop at just belief, and others, they go on and give more rights to the Qur'an. So the example of a believer who recites the Qur'an and acts on it is like an orange, which tastes nice and also smells nice. So fragrant, 
So delicious, so sweet, that you have one and you want more. The example, it's an example, doesn't mean literally the person is an orange, but it means that like an orange, tastes beautiful and also smells beautiful. And the example of the believer who does not recite the Qur'an, doesn't recite it, but he does act on it, because he learned a few things here and there, is like a date that tastes sweet but has no smell. It has no beautiful smell, a date. And the example of the person who recites the Qur'an, but doesn't act on it, doesn't have strong iman, he just recites the Qur'an. Why? Because that's what you've been taught to do and that's something that he just wishes to excel in. Not doing it really for the sake of Allah, for the sake of the reward, not really implementing the Qur'an in his life. The example of such a person is like a basil, which smells good but tastes bitter. Smells good but tastes bitter. And the example of a hypocrite who does not recite the Qur'an is like a colosin. It's like a bitter apple, which tastes bitter and has a bad smell. So we can all reflect on ourselves over here. Then which category do we belong to? Someone who just believes in the Qur'an and that's it? Or someone who believes in the Qur'an and also recites? But does he stop there? No, he should move on. Also act on it. The more rights of the Qur'an a believer gives, the better he becomes in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Think about it. If there's something that just tastes good, but doesn't smell that good, are you pulled towards it? Not that much. But if there's something that smells good, right? you are attracted by its smell, and you wonder, what is this? And when you look at it, and it also appears to look good, and you know that it tastes good, then you are pulled towards it even more. Even more. And this is just us, human beings. وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَى If there is a believer who has iman, loves the Qur'an in his heart, recites it from his mouth, and acts on it, understands its meaning in his mind, in his heart, reflects on it, imagine what kind of a rank he will have before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So why should we stay back? Why should we deprive ourselves of the potential that we have before us? Of the high rank that we can achieve in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, a scholar once said that it doesn't befit a person who has some knowledge that he wastes himself. That he has some knowledge. For example, now alhamdulillah, we have learned about the importance of reciting the Qur'an, learning the Qur'an, implementing the Qur'an. We have this knowledge. So it doesn't befit us that we waste ourselves. How would we waste ourselves? By not benefiting from that knowledge and excelling, going higher. Achieving more. So it doesn't befit a person who has given knowledge that he stays back. Once he learns, he must go forwards. He must achieve more because he has the potential to reach great heights then. He has the potential to really earn high ranks near Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when Allah gives the opportunity to a person, he must take advantage of it. Khabbab bin Al-Arat radiallahu anhu He said to a man Draw near to Allah Come close to Allah As much as you are able Every day, every moment You should be striving to Go closer to Allah Closer and closer Every salah you pray Every fast you keep Every time you remember Allah You should try to go closer and closer to Allah. Every day should bring you closer to Allah. He said, draw near to Allah as much as you are able. But listen to the next part. He said, and know that you will never draw near to Him with anything more beloved to Him than His words. Meaning that you can never feel close to Allah unless and until the words of Allah that He has revealed you recite them, you understand them, you act on them. That is the only way to go closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no other way. Because how do you come close to someone? How? When you hear them, when you get to know them, when you spend time with them. Correct? That is the way that you have a closer relationship with somebody. And the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we don't know them, 
don't listen to them, don't implement them, then how can we have closeness to Allah? The one whom you are close to, you spend time with them. Isn't it? Don't we spend time with them? If we have an email of theirs, we read it again and again. If we have a text message of theirs, we read it. Even though we've read it before, but why do we read it again and again? Why? Because we love them. So just like that, the Qur'an, they are the words of our Lord. They are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we want to be close to Him, then we have to spend time with the Qur'an. You may have experienced it in the month of Ramadan, when you are listening to the Qur'an, when you are reciting the Qur'an, the level of your iman is different. The joy that you feel is different. The peace, the satisfaction, the contentment that you have in your heart, it's at a different level. But then what happens when that Qur'an is missing from your life? Like, I don't know what to do. You're crying and you don't know why you're crying. You're sad and you don't know why you're sad. You have everything, yet you're not satisfied. You're fighting and arguing with people who are close to you, even though there's no reason to. Every little thing bothers us. Why? Because the level of iman is low. So how can that be pumped up? How can that be increased? With the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a statement of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. He said, whoever loves the Qur'an, then he loves Allah and His Messenger. Whoever loves the Qur'an, then he loves Allah and His Messenger. This means that whoever does not love the Qur'an, he cannot love Allah enough. He cannot love the Prophet ﷺ enough. And if we don't love Allah, if we don't love the Messenger ﷺ, is our iman complete? We all know the hadith that none of you can truly believe until the Prophet ﷺ is more beloved to him than his parents and his children and his wealth and even himself. So we have to love the Prophet ﷺ and we have to love Allah even more. How can we develop that love? By reading the Qur'an, by loving the Qur'an. This is why in a hadith, which is in Silsilat al-Ahadith al-Sahiha, that whoever wishes to love Allah and His Messenger, then he should recite what is in the Mus'haf. Whoever wishes to love Allah and His Messenger should recite what is in the Mus'haf, meaning he should recite what is in the Qur'an. Many times we feel that that love is not that strong, that love needs to be increased. Because when we don't have the motivation to obey Allah, what is missing? Love. When we don't have the motivation to follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, what's missing? Love. So that love has to be increased. And how will that be increased? By reading the Qur'an that Allah has revealed. By reciting it, by reflecting on it, by understanding its meanings. And every letter that a person reads, he is rewarded for it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give all of us the ability to recite His book, to understand His book, to spend our life, some time of our life at least, in trying to understand the meaning of His book. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those for whom this Qur'an will be an argument. Not against them, but for them. That the Qur'an will come on the Day of Judgment defending the person. That why should this person go to the hellfire? This person should not be punished because he recited the Qur'an. Because he understood the Qur'an. He had Qur'an in his heart. So how can this heart go in the hellfire? This Qur'an will argue for some people on the Day of Judgment. But those who sincerely learned the Book of Allah, absorbed it, took it in, made it a part of their lives, benefited themselves, benefited those around them. This Qur'an, the rope of Allah, that is what we need to get to Him, to earn closeness to Him, to make Him happy. If we want the title, رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ وَرَضُوْهُمْ If we want Allah to be happy with us, and us to be happy with Him, then this Qur'an is the answer. This Qur'an is the answer. So let's make dua with the bottom of our hearts, that may Allah give us the ability to spend our lives with His book in the service of his book, in the implementation of his book, applying his book, benefiting from it, inshallah. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik, nashadu an la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayki.